Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us today for History's Lunch. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. A few reminders of some upcoming programs. The popular Pressed Flower Workshop at the Eudora Welty House and Garden is being offered again the morning of Monday, February 24th. The registration fee of $20 covers all materials for that. You can contact the Welty House for more information or to register. Then on Thursday, February 27th at 6 p.m., we'll launch the new Many Stories series in the Museum of Mississippi History, this one focusing on the history of African-American churches in the state during Reconstruction. The speakers will be C.J. Rhodes, pastor of Mount Helm Missionary Baptist Church, the oldest black church in Jackson, and Tougaloo College archivist Tony Bounds. So please join us for that. And I hope that you will be back with us next week for History's Lunch when Jerry Nash and Andy Taggart will reunite to present two Mississippi governors from the first and last decades of the 20th century. If you are members of the Mississippi Historical Society, you will have received your latest issue of the Journal of Mississippi History, which focuses on Mississippi governors, and Nash and Taggart wrote two of the articles in that. Today, we are delighted to have Gary Benton with us to present NASA Stennis Space Center, a historical view of America's largest rocket engine test complex. We scheduled this presentation to coincide with NASA Day at the museums tomorrow when several hundred students will explore Mississippi's role in the history of space travel. We're excited for that. Gary Benton is director of the Safety and Mission Assurance Directorate at the Stennis Space Center. A native of Meridian, he earned an undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from Mississippi State University. In 1988, Benton began his career at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida and transferred to Stennis Space Center in 1997. Throughout his NASA career, Benton has conducted a variety of rocket engine test firings. He also helped manage the construction of the Stennis E Test Complex, a research and development facility for testing that involves ultra high pressure gases and super cold fuels. Help me welcome Gary Benton. All right, everybody. Well, it's great to be here today um, and, and get to talk about some of the, the great work we're doing at NASA. Um, so I appreciate the invite. And, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you about the, the history of Stennis. It's America's largest um, rocket engine test complex. You know, in, in the photo, you can see the various uh, test stands, the A1 and A2 and A3, B1 and B2 and the E complex and the support facilities that go along with that. Um, you know, today it's obvious that Stennis Space Center is a real success story. From unlikely beginnings to audacious planning to ongoing excellence, the story of Stennis is one of endurance and achievement writ large. Yet there were few in the dawn of the 60s and even the late 70s who would have envisioned such a future for this tucked away NASA site um, that blasted Mississippi and the entire nation into the greatest era of space exploration ever recorded. It's doubtful well that anyone could have written the story of how Stennis succeeded. Um, for most, the expected path of success involves going from worse to better to best. In a way, however, Stennis defied all the odds by succeeding from going best to worst. Um, <clears throat> uh, it all started uh, with selection of Hancock County in South Mississippi um, to be the rocket engine test site. Um, in May 25, 1961, President Kennedy announced to Congress that we were going to send um, men to the moon and get them back safely by the end of the decade. So that's quite a feat to say we're going to do that in eight years. And at this point in time, the Marshall Space Flight Center was already built, and we had some launch capabilities at, at, Cape, at down there at Cape Canaveral. But, you know, we didn't have a mission control. We didn't have a, a lander that these astronauts could live in and go to the moon. And we didn't have a rocket. We didn't have a rocket or engines designed at this point, um, much less facilities to test them. So um, NASA announced the decision to establish this national rocket engine test site in Hancock, Mississippi on October 25th of 1961. Um, again, they were looking at several sites to, to, do the, to do the testing. There were a couple sites in Texas, um, I think one outside of New Orleans and Louisiana, some in Florida. Um, now, Senator Stennis was obviously a strong force in Congress, so he probably helped get it here. But another reason why we chose Hancock County was because of the buffer zone. 
Uh, there were a few people that lived there, but not many, surrounded by woods. Um, the rockets were going to be built in Michoud, and we could deliver them to Stennis Space Center using the waterway. These rockets were too big to put on a truck or, or carry by the road. So we had access to interstates and waterways, and um, we had a good spot here. So in, in the end, they chose um, Hancock County, Mississippi, to be where we were going to test these, these big rocket engines. You know, some of you may have heard about um, Warner Von Braun, you know, the, the, the rocket scientist that was the architect of the, the Saturn rocket and the whole moon mission. And there's a quote where he said, I don't know yet by what method we'll use to get to the moon, but I know we'll have to go through Mississippi to get there. Um, and again, so in this location we'd chosen, there were some small towns there, and there were still people living there. Um, a lot of logging industry and stuff like that was going on in the area. Um, but, you know, in order to build this facility there, we were going to have to have these people leave and relocate, and some of them weren't very happy about that. But there were towns like um, Gainesville, Santa Rosa, Logtown. Um, um, but what another quote from John C. Stennis was, there's always a thorn before the rose. You've got to make sacrifices, but you'll be taking part in greatness. You know, so a lot of these people that lived there probably weren't worried that much about going to the moon or the space race or anything. But, um, you know, Senator Stennis has said, look, this is going to be part of history. And it was, you know, because this, this is where we tested all the rockets that went to the moon. And um, so they did have to give up some of their land and be relocated. But... Um, you know, hopefully many of them thought it was worth it. Um, in December 18, 1961, the rocket test site was officially named Mississippi Test Operations. And again, um, we were really at that time a field center for um, Marshall Space Flight Center. And in May 17, 1963, you know, the people started cutting down the trees and clearing the land, getting ready to build these test stands. So if you haven't been down to Stennis, you know, it's really in the middle of a swamp. So these these folks that had to clear the site, you know, had to do with mosquitoes and um, hurricanes and all kinds of bad weather conditions and in the swamp. So it was quite an effort, but um, <clears throat> we um, had the Army Corps of Engineers are the ones that designed and came in and built these facilities. And so you can see some of the milestones and um, the first pile driving of the A-1 test stand in 1964, August, and A-2 stand in April 30th of 1965 and the B-1, B-2 test stand in April 8 of 1965. So, you know, I work for NASA today, and I know how long it takes to get construction projects done and through procurement and everything, and, and getting these facilities of this size and complexity built in this short amount of time was, was quite an extraordinary effort. Um, so they really, you know, Congress was serious about it, the President was serious about it, and they poured the money into it, and they did what it took to get these facilities built. And if you haven't been out there, the humongous, you can get a, 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 you know, an idea of the scale of that B1, B2 test stand, you know, how big of a hole they had to dig and how much concrete and rebar, you know, had to be put into these facilities and able to hold down these, these huge rockets. Um, and October 16 of 1965, the Saturn V S2T rocket stage, this was the first stage um, delivered for testing. And it was actually, the dash T on there was a test version. So they wanted to do to run a static hot fire test on a test rocket before they brought the real ones in. And I brought with me um, a little model of the Saturn V rocket. And, um, you know, this is the second stage of the, the Saturn V rocket. So this is the first piece that came to Stennis to be tested. Um, the core stage takes it up to about 100,000 feet, and then this piece would take the, the crew and the module and the lander up into orbit, and then there was a third stage that would take off and bring them to the moon. But this second stage was the, the first one to test, and NASA had never built a, um, a rocket with, a with this big of a hydrogen um, tank and this big of a stage, so they were really worried about, um, you know, the damage that could result. So there are two separate test stands, and they're located a little bit away from each other, A1 and A2, and that's where we tested these, these second stages um, of this rocket. And... Uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, if it comes undone, things can go bad fast and it can leave a lot of damage. So they, they did have a duplicate test stand in case they had a catastrophe on one test stand. They knew they could get back and test the other one. And they were a little more worried about that stage than they were about the, the core stage, which was kerosene and liquid oxygen. We had had more experience with um, rockets of this size. And these were tested on the B-1 and the uh, B-2 test stand. Um, and th that stand had dual positions, um, 
and again, there was another renaming to Mississippi Test Facility in, in July of 1965. And here's a, an old photo of that, that first stage, uh, the, the Saturn II stage being tested. It was a 15 second test on the A2 test stand at 7.33 in the morning. Um, again, we went on to test all of these, so we went several trips to the moon and the Saturn V rocket was the one that was used every time we, we took a module and put it um, into orbit. And uh, Stennis was chosen to test large rocket stages. So this is the tanks, the valves, the engines, all assembled. These individual engines got tested elsewhere. They were tested at Marshall, some of them out in California, some of them in Tullahoma and Tennessee. But nonetheless, they built these rockets and assembled them at Michu Test Facility down there by New Orleans, put them on the, uh, put them in the waterway and brought them into the stand and we ran a test on each one of these. Every one of these that flew to the moon got tested at Stennis. This core stage, this big one, got tested on the B2 stand and the second stage got tested on A1 and A2. So, um, you know, the rocket also has a third stage, which is the part that had the crew and the lander in it. Um, we didn't do any of this testing at Stennis. I think this stage might have been tested at, at Marshall or, uh, or up at Plumbrook. So um, again, you know, a big deal um, being right in the middle of the, the critical path for getting to the moon and, um, you know, all the work it took in such a short amount of time to get these facilities ready. Um, and there you can see in July 16, 1969, um, there's Apollo 11, and that's the mission that took uh, Neil Armstrong to the moon. So, you know, so Stennis was really built to beginning to, to make this happen. And we, of course, we met the goal that the president and Congress had given us to, to get people to the moon and safely back. And um, so all those folks that put in all that hard effort to get those facilities built and run the testing, you know, we, we met the goal. But then what happens after that, right? So, uh, you know, the next administrations or whatever didn't really want to focus more on going back to the moon. We didn't think there was any water there or any resources, you know, and we had been, we had beaten the Russians to the moon. And so there wasn't a sense of urgency at the time to continue doing moon or Mars missions. What we wanted to do was um, we shifted gears and wanted to go to a reusable vehicle called the space shuttle. And um, at, at first, you know, they weren't planning on doing any of that testing at Stennis. Like I said, they could test the individual engines at other sites. And um, they weren't even sure if they were ever going to do a stage test for, for the shuttle. Um, but that's where Stennis and Jerry Halas and some others um, you know, during the, when, the, when they knew the Saturn program was ended, you know, they came up with ideas on how to convince people to bring the space shuttle main engine testing to Stennis and also get other federal agencies to come in there and set up shop, like the Naval Research Laboratory or the National Oceanographic um, folks. Um, so they wanted to, you know, they wanted to keep good jobs in the area and, and, and keep, keep it going, and they wanted to be able to use these facilities. They didn't want it to end and have everything go away. So um, some of those local politicians and people really did a good job of bringing the space shuttle main engine testing to Stennis. And, um, you know, eventually we got renamed to National Space Technology Laboratories again. So we're expanding into more than just doing the, the rocket engine tests. Um, but so, you know, the shuttle was a reusable vehicle. I think we realized we need to do more research of space and spend time in low Earth orbit to really understand how to long term live in space before we set up a moon colony or something. And um, so the shuttle flew 135 times. There was three engines on the shuttle and many of those engines got tested at Stennis Space Center also. And so that was um, stuff that was going on in the 70s. And here's a kind of a, a cute photo. There's Center Stennis in the middle, you know, dancing a jig after viewing the space shuttle main engine test on A1 and Jerry Halas and Robert Giggs of Rocketdyne and, and Bob Busher in the picture. So, you know, those two gentlemen on the left had a lot to do with um, making sure that the Space Center stayed relevant after the moon missions were done. And I guess Interstellar was pretty happy after seeing that engine test go off on A1 as another, you know, another goal that they set off to do that, that they achieved. Um, and then in May 20 of 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed an executive order renaming the National Space Test Laboratory to John C. Stennis in honor of the U.S. Senator. And as you can see, you know, that was, that was well deserved from all the hard work that he did. Um, you know, moving um, forward, the federal city uh, concept was another thing that they, that they worked on. 
And you can see the various uh, agencies up here that are reside out there now. This all started with the, the, the stage testing, but we've got the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Weather Service, the Bowie Center, um, Department of Defense, the Army Corps of Engineers, Metrology and Oceanography, lots of Navy presence out there. They're training our war fighters. The Navy SEALs train down there, special boat teams. Um, some of the other, um, you know, uh, space-related business, um, you know, rocket, Aerojet Rocketdyne builds the RS-68 engines and the RS-25 engines there at their test, at their facility. Lockheed Martin has a um, satellite assembly facility located out there. Rolls-Royce tests aircraft engines out there. Um, USM and Mississippi State have offices out there. And, um, you know, um, Geological Survey, Department of Homeland Security, and, and, and lots of other um, companies out there that, that do business. Uh, and this was another vision that, that Jerry Halas and Senator Stennis had, was to make this a federal city and have all these other tenants come in bring jobs there, important work, important science and technology, and um, also they could share in the cost of running the whole facility and not just have NASA um, bear the whole burden. Um, you know, we lost uh, two space shuttles over the years in 86 Challenger and in 2003 uh, Columbia, and so um, those were tragic losses, but NASA learned a lot in, in those lessons and were able to make the vehicle safer after those. Um, each time we lost a shuttle, we were down for a couple of years to do an investigation and make uh, process changes and other things to ensure that wouldn't happen again. And on July 16, 2004, you know, there you can see um, a return to flight mission um, for, for one of the shuttle tests, uh, shuttle main engine tests. And then the final SSME test was done on July 29, 2009 at the A2 test stand. Um, you know, again, we had the uh, the space shuttle uh, had three of these engines. The engines were re re reusable. The whole vehicle was really reusable, but they would take these engines back after flight, refurbish them, and then we'd run another test on them. And so with three engines on the shuttle and flying 135 times, you know, you can do the math and figure out there's roughly 400, you know, engines that got to be tested. And that didn't count all the development tests that they had to do before these engines were ready for flight. So um, we had space shuttle main engine testing going on at the A1 stand, the A2 stand, and at the B1 stand. And sometimes, you know, they would, they would test fire on each one of those stands in a given week. So um, again, from the 70s to the 80s to the end of the program in 2009, the center was very busy testing these space shuttle main engines. Um, there was various block upgrades that we did, and we also ran them through a green run before they, they flew again. And so, um, you know, those facilities, even they were, they were designed for these large uh, rocket stages, they certainly could take advantage of a lot of the capability they had to test engines. Um, the same fuels, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, um, thrust takeout structures, data systems, control systems. Um, so we were able to use those facilities for more than they were originally designed. Um, you know, looking to the, uh, the future, um, you know, our administrators put the goal out there to get the first man and the first woman back on the moon by 2024. Okay, so we've got this um, SLS rocket that we've been working on that we're about to do another stage test similar to what we did back for Apollo. Um, we've got the RS-25 engines tested. And the first flight is planned for, uh, I think, in 2021. And we'll send a spacecraft to the moon um, and then the next mission would be uh, people on the spacecraft that orbit the moon. And the third mission would be to actually land on the moon on the South Pole. So, you know, again, we had gone to the moon before, but over all these years, you know, we've learned a lot more about how to live in space on the space station. Um, you know, we've sent various probes and rovers to the moon and found that there's, there's water on the moon, there's ice on the moon. So you say, yeah, how is there ice on the moon? Well. Some of these comets and some of these asteroids you hear about, that's what it is. It's a big hunk of ice flying through the solar system. And, um, it, you know, one of those struck the moon and buried itself in there, and it being so cold, it stayed ice. So we found ice on the moon. Um, you know, we found water on, on Mars also. So, again, you know, while we've been working in low Earth orbit 
um, learning um, how to live in space and doing all the critical research on the space station, um, you know, we've learned that there's, you know, other resources on the moon and possibly uh, a better way to, to sustain that. So we, we uh, have our new program nicknamed Artemis. So if you remember the old uh, uh, mission was called Apollo. Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo in the Greek mythology. And so our administrator decided to name this, this mission um, Artemis. And the next person that, that lands on the moon is going to be an American astronaut. And that's going to be a woman. So that's what we're doing right now. There's some other elements like the gateway module. So we're going to build kind of like a mini space station around the moon. They've already got the procurements for those going. And we're going to use some of our commercial partners launchers to get that done. Um, some of those folks we've worked with over the years um, uh, testing their hardware also, which I think I'll get to in, a, in another slide coming up. And, you know, a human lander system, which right now we've, we've uh, the president's put in the budget request to fund the lander. So now we'll see what Congress comes back with, and then hopefully we'll be awarding a lander contract. And then we'll, for the first time since Apollo, we'll have funded, um, you know, a, a spacecraft that can take people and land them on the moon. So this is kind of our, um, you know, our goal for the next three or four years. And, and what's happening at Stennis? Well, we're testing those engines, those RS-25 engines, just like we tested the space shuttle main engines. Um, we've got the core stage in the test stand. We're going to test that later this year. And when they do block upgrades, I'm sure we'll have other stages and other engines to, to test. So we'll continue to use those facilities um, to test at Stennis. This is a, a picture of an RS-25 engine test. Um, that we did in um, January of 2015. So after shuttle, uh, the space shuttle program was over, we had 16 engines left over. Um, that, like I said, these engines got reused. And so we decided um, uh, when NASA um, designed the SLS rocket, which is our new rocket, there'd be uh, four, so, uh, exactly four of these engines the on the rocket. Engine. So here's a little video to show you what a test is like at Stennis NASA's these days. Space launch system which will be the most powerful rocket in the world and will send our astronauts to the moon and eventually to Mars. NASA has 16 RS-25s with plans to build more and each SLS rocket will have four engines. These engines are big, really big. The RS-25 is 14 feet tall and eight feet in diameter. That is about the size and weight of a compact car or two F-15 jet engines and produces eight times more thrust. Along with the two solid rocket boosters, the RS-25 engines will power the SLS at speeds of 17,500 miles per hour. That's 73 times faster than an Indy 500 race car. For three decades, the RS-25 helped propel the space shuttle into orbit. These engines have been modified and upgraded for their bold new mission and are being tested at NASA's Stennis Space Center. These big, beautiful engines are designed to send astronauts on future missions beyond Earth's orbit and advance American leadership in space. To learn more about the RS-25 engine and NASA's space launch system, go to nasa.gov slash SLS. So there you go. That gives you an idea of, um, you know, what the test is like and how this rocket is designed. So, you know, we're not using the old um, Saturn V's anymore. Um, we've got this rocket. It takes advantage of these large solid rocket motors, which were um, used on the space shuttle. These are a little bit bigger. And... Um, it's got a, a large uh, core stage that, that we've got in the, in the B2 stand right now. Um, and so, like I said earlier, you know, here's a, you know, a, a more recent version of the B2 stand. You can see we've added some height to it to, for this large rocket to be able to fit in there. Um, and uh, another shot of the, the RS-25 testing. So again, we've been busy the last few years uh, getting all this stuff ready for the Artemis missions and getting this SLS rocket um, ready to certify and fly. And we're going to be busy in the future um, doing that same thing. Um, this is pretty neat because it's the first time, you know, since the early 70s that we had a large rocket stage in the stand. Remember, we talked about originally with Saturn and going to the moon with the Saturn rocket that we had these big stages, which is what these stands were for. And then when we were done with those missions, we converted them over to single engine test facilities. And so um, here's that B2 stand, again, originally designed for the first stage 
of the Saturn V rocket, and there's the first SLS core stage being put in the stand. So this was just, I think in January, it showed up on the barge from Michoud, and we got it in the stand. We lifted it up, did some modal testing on it to make sure all the um, frequency modes are like they're supposed to be. And um, they've got a little more work to do on the engines before we power the vehicle up next month and get it ready to test later in the summer. And once we're done testing it, you know, we'll put it on the barge and we'll ship it down to Kennedy Space Center. It'll go into the VAB and it'll get stacked. They'll attach those two solid rocket motors to it. They'll put the upper stage on it. And then they'll put the Orion uh, crew module on the top, which has just finished testing up in uh, Plumbrook in Cleveland, Ohio. And they'll stack the rocket and then we'll have our first um, SLS launch um, sometime, I think, in 2021 and then it'll be followed up. They'll use that rocket over and over again to get the, the astronauts to the moon and to get other cargo um, up, into, uh, up into space. Um, I skipped a little bit of a, you know, that we talked about the, the moon program, and we talked about the shuttle program, and then we kind of skipped over to SLS today, and we talked about the, all the other businesses that located to the area to set up shop at Space Center. Another thing that happened was um, in the late 80s, I believe, we built some other test stands, and they're called the E-Complex. Um, and there's three different test stands with seven different test positions that we built and upgraded in the late 80s all the way to the 90s into 2000. And so there's a whole other part of the rocket testing, which really is aside from the NASA missions, like the Moon program, the Space Shuttle missions, or the SLS and the Artemis missions. There's all this commercial work, and a lot of that's happened at the E-Complex. Um, you know, some of you may be watching what SpaceX is doing with their Falcon launches, and they recover the booster, and they've got this big starship that they're developing, you know, which is going to their way to get um, crew and cargo back to the moon or Mars. Um, you hear these other companies like Relativity that are building much smaller rockets that they can 3D print. So they can come in and flip a switch and print the rocket motor or the engine. And, you know, they don't have to use machining and welding and all that. And, and as technology increases, you know, you can get a lot more bang for your buck with, with mass. So some of these companies are building these very small, very cheap rockets that they can launch uh, small satellites. And um, so, you know, Relativity Space is out there testing at two of our test facilities right now. And um, we did some early on development testing. We partnered with SpaceX. They used one of our facilities to test not the rocket engine, but the components of the rocket engine. So, you know, the rocket engine, sometimes you want to test the turbo pumps or the thrust chambers or the valves separately so that when you run the full engine test, you don't burn the whole engine up, risk reduction. So these um, E-complex test facilities that we have have a lot of capability with high pressure and flow. We can simulate some of these harsh conditions inside the rocket and do component testing. And so we just finished a very busy period at E1 where we had three or four different customers in there testing stuff like the AR1 um, engine components. Um, Strata Launch was doing some um, component testing. Um, you hear about Blue Origin and the, um, they, they're, they've got a rocket that they launch in Texas and they, you know, you can buy a ticket and get on the rocket and go into low Earth, low Earth orbit and then land. And, um, you know, Jeff Bezos, their, their CEO, has plans of doing other things. So we helped test their um, thrust chamber at E1. And um, when Orbital ATK was flying cargo missions back and forth to the space station, we tested the AJ-26 engine in the E1, E1 test stand. And right now we still test the RS-68 engines. Um, on the other side, that B1, B2 test stand, it's got an SLS core stage in one side, and it's got RS-68 engines that they test individually on the other side. That R68 engine powers the Delta IV rockets, and a lot of those rockets fly um, uh, Department of Defense satellites and very critical payloads, and, and so that work gets done there too. So you can see how, um, you know, all this time, um, how, this, how the center's grown and how much other, you know, work has evolved over the time with these facilities and all these tenants and other people moving in. So, um, you know, it's really a, a great place to work and, um, you know, and, you know, we're busier than ever. And um, there's another uh, thing I can talk to you a little bit about is Enterprise Park. So, you know, in, the, in, in that area, you know, you can see where the, the buffer zone is. And there's a lot of land and um, 
other uh, you know capability there and of course we would like to bring other businesses in if we can to help move into the area for the jobs and economic growth and whatnot so there's a a project in work um, called Enterprise Park where we're you know working with different entities in Mississippi and others to see if anybody else wants to relocate there and take advantage of some of this land you know we still it's critical that we protect that buffer zone because that's what allows us to test these big rockets and engines you know and 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 nowadays that's really important because they can't do this testing in a lot of places because the noise level is just too much for the public and so um, you know over all these years you know the politicians and center directors have tried to protect that buffer zone to keep you know people from wanting to develop and move in there um, and it's allowed us to be able to continue to do uh, the critical testing that we do for NASA so this just gives you an idea of some of the sites they have that are you know potentially there uh, you know for future development um, another thing um, recently that we did was we expanded the airspace and restricted some airspace um, you can see, uh, and this is what my friend Carm over there works with us on this, you can see a DOD scan eagle. So now, you know, you hear about these, um, uh, what are they, drones or unmanned aerial vehicles? Yeah, UAVs. So this is the newest thing, right? These, um, these um, the, the DOD can practice um, flying these um, unmanned drones around and, you know, again, I think what they have is some, you know, pretty sophisticated sensor packages and they're working out there to try to try to help our warfighters and other things. But we've got a, you know, we worked a deal with the FAA. It took a lot of work to, to get this restricted airspace opened up. And so the Department of Defense has taken a lot of advantage of that, you know, of being able to do a lot of testing that they want to do for the military and taking advantage of that buffer zone. You know, they can do all these flights and everything because they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, damaging people's property or scaring people. And, um, you know, again, that's another, um, you know, just another thing that's happened in the history of Stennis, the, the Space Center, um, you know, as time goes on. And, um, you know, we can talk about the economic impact. Um, you know, again, it's very important uh, for the region. I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of great jobs there. Um, and you can see the economic impact of $849 million for direct global and um, in the 50-mile radius, $561 million. Um, you can see NASA is a big part, but also the Navy is a very, very big part. And um, you can see how those other tenants and other companies and everything make it up. So today, you know, the total workforce is about 5,200, and the average salary with benefits is 89,000. Those are great jobs. I can tell you, I got, I got three kids just got out of college, and they're looking for good jobs. And, you know, it's hard to find sometimes a good job, but there certainly are a lot of them down there. And so, that again, that's a tribute to our, our leaders for you know, helping develop the Space Center and keep it growing and making sure we stay relevant. And, you know, we talk a lot about NASA. I spent my whole career with NASA, but it's not just engineers that work out there. There's all kinds of business and professional uh, technicians and crafts, clerical and other. You can see a breakdown of the, the degrees, you know, the percents of, uh, you know, um, graduate degrees and other folks with, with a high school diploma. And... Um, <clears throat> kind of the distribution of the personnel you know there's um probably a third that are on the coast and a third that are down there in louisiana and then a third that live up in picayune maybe in pearl river county and others um but um so you know it's a neat place to be because you can go live on the coast or you can kind of live in in a city like slidell or be out in the country um so anyway i finished up i guess i finished up a little quick we, we have a uh, time for plenty of questions if we want um so now they got a microphone, so they're going to pass you the microphone because there might be some people listening online that want to be able to hear the question. So, yeah, just raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Yes, ma'am. I have a second question that I'll ask later after other people have had their turn, but I wanted to ask uh, the planetarium here in Jackson has a sign which also had the 1961, October 1961 date on it. Ever since I saw that, I've wondered what the, whether there was discussion in that period following 1955, Emmett Till, 1959, Wade-ins on the coast, 1961, 36 Mississippi Freedom Riders and dozens of others from other places. How did Mississippi end up with 
this massive federal project, was there discussion, and I'm asking you from your research and actually anyone else in the room from your research, was there any discussion about the appropriateness of this or other things related to it? All right, so if I understood your question correctly, you're talking about maybe what, what happened before 1961. Um, you're talking in the mid-50s to 1961, and, and were they given, um, you know, who was thinking about doing this here, and was it appropriate? You've got me stumped there, because I really don't know what happened then. I know that, that the Russians launched space, uh, that Sputnik, and that's what started the space race, and that's one of the reasons we were in a real hurry to get to the moon. And, um, you know, they made the announcement in 61. I imagine it was, you know, a year or two before that that they started talking about how they're going to pull off this moon mission. And, you know, like I said, they were talking about maybe doing it in Louisiana or Texas or Florida. And um, they ended up with the site. But before what happened before that, ma'am, I'm not really sure. I don't know if anybody else in here may know more about that part of the time than I do. This is a more technical question. I noticed from the maps that the uh, it looks like the route by sea to get the engines in there involves the lower end of the Pearl River. And my question is, is that all secure? And uh, how, what proportion of the engines that are tested now uh, arrive by that route? Yeah, the, uh, the engines can actually be delivered by truck, the single engines we talked about. But back when we were talking about these big stages and that SLS core stage, you're correct. They do come up on a barge, and they have to come up the part of the Pearl River. Um, we've got a lock, and, um, a lock system out there, kind of similar to the Panama Canal, where we can control the water level in the waterways. And, um, you know, once it's on the site, it is somewhat secure, um, you know, and it doesn't hurt to have the Navy and the DOD out there um, kind of practicing operations when the big rocket's coming up the, the canal. Um, I'm not really sure about in the open waters. I mean, I'm sure the Coast Guard's out there and others are helping make sure, you know, we're protected when we bring it um, up the waterway. But the single engines don't need, to, that don't need to come up the waterway, but those big rocket stages do. And... Um, so there's going to be, you know, more of that coming as those big stages come and go for SLS. Yes, ma'am. I am going to presume to answer the first question. And it's about politics and power. And I just, sir, I just feel sure that you know that. John Stennis was very powerful. He was chairman of the Appropriations Committee. He signed the checks. And... It is politics, whoever your representative is, they're going to look out for their state. And he looked out for Mississippi. And the fact that there was no thought given to those social issues, again, he didn't have to because he was the power. It's a great thing for the state. Yeah, it certainly was. And, and yeah, you know, he was a, he was a, you know, certainly a powerful force and, you know, a major reason that we, we built the center where it was. And that's why it's named after him. Certainly. I agree. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, thank you. How do you get the rockets from Mississippi to Cape Canaveral or Cape Kennedy? Do you have special barges that do this? Is yeah. It, are they barged? I thought there might have been a picture of one of them in here. Did we show a picture of the Pegasus barge? Yeah, there it is. So you see that big um, horizontal? Um, that's called the Pegasus barge. And so um, when we get done with the rocket, we'll um, we use a couple of cranes to break it over to horizontal, and we set it in a fixture, and then we can roll it into that big... Um, barge which has got the um, the roof on it and that's what we use we'll hook a tugboat up and we'll tug that down and um, go out into the Gulf of Mexico and around the coast of Florida and bring it back up to, to Cape Canaveral where they'll they'll get it back on land again and and get it ready for um, testing on the launch pad so we use that for the shuttle MPTA I think uh, we used it for um, may have used it for I don't know if we use that barge for the Saturn rockets back to an Apollo or not, but, right. 
That's right. We did modify it. This SLS rocket's even longer on the core stage than it was for the moon rocket. So that's that's the same barge we used back in the 60s to, to get the rockets down to the launch pads at the Cape. I, I have two kind of questions. One is, when you say solid rocket, what do you mean by the solid part? And the other is, when the rockets have been, um, when they have gone up and then they come back down, because you say you reuse them, how do they do that? How do they get them and where do they go? I mean, are they landing in water? What, what happens? Yeah, so, um, you know, this rocket that we had before didn't have the solids on it, but it had a lot more powerful engines. And um, the solid rocket motor is basically solid fuel. So if you were to look at it, you know, it would be a hard solid. And um, it's some kind of magnesium compound that burns really hot and heavy. And um, versus liquid motors, which is um, a lot of the rockets are powered on liquids where you're talking about rocket fuel, diesel fuel type, refined kerosene or RP1, um, or liquid hydrogen as a fuel or liquid methane, which is becoming more popular now. Um, and then you use the liquid oxygen to be the oxidizer with that fuel. And so those get, those get mixed up and um, ignited into the, into the chamber. So that's the difference between liquid and solids. And a lot of the rockets today use a combination of both. Sometimes they'll strap some solids onto the sides to get a little extra push. Um, for SLS, those are major. That's 3.12 million pounds of thrust, I think, for each of those side-mounted solids. Um, so those solid rocket motors, when we reused them for shuttle, they would, the shuttle would um, you know, eject those when they were spent, and then they would parachute down. They'd land in the ocean, soft land in the ocean, and then we'd send a uh, boat out there, and they'd put them on the boat. They'd bring them back to Kennedy, and then they'd clean them up and refurbish them, send them back out, have them loaded with solid rockets again, and reuse them. The shuttle engines were also reusable, as the whole shuttle vehicle was, because those engines stayed on the vehicle. So when it landed, you know, it landed with all three engines, and so then they would be they would refurbed and tested. Um, now SpaceX is doing it a little bit differently right now with their Falcon 9 rocket, where they actually land the whole stage back down with the engines intact, and um, they're able to land those on floating barges out in the in, in the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean. Um, and they're even trying to catch the fairings that are that is another piece of the rocket. And so with today's technology and computers and GPS and everything, you know, that's how they can they can nail those targets. Now they don't always successfully land, but um, you know, their whole thing is trying to make it reusable and make it cheaper so that they can win more launches and be profitable. So there's those are the different ways that that, that it's reusable. Um, you know, Blue Origin has a rocket they launch. It's similar to the SpaceX's Falcon, but they don't, they don't go all the way into orbit right now. But basically that same engine that launches it up, you know, when it comes down, they'll do a couple of short bursts on that engine and they're able to find control it so that it can, it can land back down there without crashing. So um, those are some of the different ways that, uh, you know, people try to reuse. Uh, also, another reason some of the folks are going to liquid methane is it's much cleaner and it's easier to refurbish those uh, rockets as opposed to using kerosene fuels, which are a little bit dirtier and have a tendency to you know, be a little bit tougher to clean up and, and clog up. So we'll see where they go with those with those methane, methane fueled engines. Is there some more questions? What are tourists allowed to see down there? Uh, we used to have tour buses that would run from the Infinity Center, um, which is right down there, right off of exit one, and a great place to visit if you're ever down there, stop by the Infinity Center. Um, uh, and I don't know if the tours still run all the time because I think they had some problems with the funding for the buses, but um, there are times when once a year we'll try to um, open a test to the public. Um, so pay attention online or whatever, and then um, at those times, you know, you can register and then we'll, we'll bring people out there to see an engine test, sometimes uh, where you can invite the families out to see them also. Um, and you know, you can contact the public affairs office there if you want a tour. Um, and I think sometimes on special requests for certain, um, you know, for certain events that, that they, they can get you on a tour. Usually it's just a bus tour where you would drive along the bus and see the test stands. Um, if you're real lucky, you know, when you got to get out there on an engine test, um, a lot of times those, those test days are hard to predict. But yeah, it's pretty much just a bus tour of the, the, the site is all you can do um, right now. I mean, if you, if, you, if you know somebody really well that works out there, they might be able to get you up on the test stand, but that's, that's hard to do. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, there are a few people in this room that are concerned about historical preservation. And with all this new traffic going to the moon, 
Does NASA have plans to preserve the original landing site of Apollo 11 with the first footprints on the moon, the first flag, and even the first golf balls? You know, you stumped me on that one. I'm, I'm sure they do for the moon site. I know that across the agency, like they just, um, they just made the VAB, the Vertical Assembly Building at Kennedy, um, a historical landmark. I believe the A1, A2, and B sands are already historical landmarks. So I know NASA has a program where we try to preserve that. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing about the moon, though. Um, so I may have to get back with you on that one, or maybe somebody else knows. But I'd imagine they would want to preserve it, and they probably have a plan to do that. I'm just... Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, I guess it was uh, the facility director during the 60s when a lot of the uh, Saturn testing was Jack, Jack Balch. And uh, when he left uh, Stennis, uh, he volunteered his uh, services to the state of Mississippi, to the governor's office, to work on water quality issues for the Gulf Coast. And I had the opportunity to work with Jack uh, for, for a good while there, and he, he related some very interesting stories about how he, he was so concerned that if at the end of the uh, uh, Apollo program, if, if the move would have been to close down the center and, and lose the buffer zone, what would happen to all of the, the jobs on the coast and how he, he started bringing in some of the, the early non-space related uh, facilities there. And uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that, and um, yeah. I think I think in some of the NASA publication they they uh, refer to Jack as a, a maverick, and that, that was I think uh, yeah those, pretty those, true. That, those folks were certainly looking ahead to the future. Um, and you know you mentioned that, and um, you know I probably could have done a little bit better job of going over that part of the history. I'm just a little less familiar with it. But since you bring it up, there's this incredible book that uh, Matt Herring wrote called Way Station to Space. And this is the first 30 years of Stennis, and, you know, um, these folks you're talking about are mentioned in here. So, you know, I'm sure you can get this book online with Amazon, but it's really good, and it, it'll fill in a lot of the, the blanks and a lot of the details that I left out that didn't, didn't really have time to or some of it I didn't really know. But it's a pretty, it's a pretty good read, so I'll, I'll leave a copy over there on the table. This is, this is my personal copy, but um, for those of y'all that are interested in more of those details, that's really a great resource. Um, Yes, sir. Yes, there's been a significant amount of discussion regarding the weaponization of the space race, particularly with Russia and possibly also mainland China, and in particular, uh, the possibility of uh, one of those competitors establishing a military installation on the moon. I ask, how, do, how does the United States match up in that space race? Uh, we believe we're further along, further ahead of China than people might think, and, and well ahead of the Russians. Um, you know, I know the administration and, and Congress and the president, you know, they want us to continue to lead, and, you know, we want to be the, the, the ones that get to the moon again first and establish lunar bases and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I know China probably has plans, but you don't, you don't hear about much that's going on. But from what I hear, you know, and I have I certainly have no firsthand knowledge, you know, I hear that we're, we're still ahead and there's still time for us to, um, you know, to, to be the leaders. So um, the Chinese do have the ability, you know, they've launched a couple of small space stations and they've launched their astronauts up to their space stations. They don't have one permanent like we have. We've had the International Space Station um, on orbit with um, constant astronaut presence for 20 years, maybe more than 20 now. Um, and, and again, we, you know, we've got partners with Japan and European Space Agency, some other countries to keep that. Um, and, and right now, you know, China and Russia are the only countries I know of that can launch astronauts up into space and, and to get back. Uh, the Russians use, of course, the International Space Station. They used to have their own, um, but when we joined with them, and, and the Chinese have one, but I don't, I don't think it's permanently manned. So uh, I think we're still in good shape for now with those guys. 
Do the astronauts receive any kind of training at the Stennis Center, and or do they ever come to visit the Stennis Center and interact with with uh, your scientists? They do. We don't. Um, they really haven't been doing any training lately that I know of. Um, they do come down frequently to thank us, you know, for running the test. A lot of the reason you test is because you want to make sure it works and that, you know, we don't have engines blow up or vehicles blow up. And, and it's their safety, you know, is, is paramount. So, um, and there's um, some Silver Snoopy Awards. They'll come by maybe every year, every two years and give out kind of a rare award um, to somebody. So we do see them probably every couple of months or three months they'll come through and visit. If there's a big event, they'll, they'll come down. But um, no, most of the training's probably done at Johnson Space Center and maybe some at Kennedy Space Center. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they come and go all the time. <clears throat> uh, long term and short term, what are the plans for the Stennis Space Center? What, p particularly budgetary for, with regard to NASA and the overall budget? Yeah, so um, NASA's budget's been kind of flat. You know, um, they're really going for a, an, an extra plus up this year of a little bit more than $3 billion. It's in the, it's in the president's request, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see if Congress will allow all that to be spent. And, and that'll be the biggest boost that NASA's gotten in some time. And really, it's all about getting that human lander funded. So um, for the NASA work at the center, it's pretty stable. Um, you know, we're going to continue to have to test all these RS-25 engines. They're not going to be reusable. So after those first four Artemis flights, um, you know, for five, six, seven, and eight, they're still uh, follow-on engines that have to be developed and tested with some modern um, um, uh, processes to make them a little cheaper. Um, we are going to test this core stage. Um, I don't know if we're going to test the second, third, or fourth, or how many core stages we'll test before they're confident. But there's a there's an upgrade to the SLS vehicle called Block 1B, where there's going to be a larger upper stage, and that's going to need to be tested. And 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 right now we've got some designs and some planning going to do that stage testing. So um, right now the RS-25s are being tested on the A1 stand, and the big stage test is going on at B2. And um, when that testing ramps back up, we've got numbers in the budget to, to bring A2 online also. So um, at least for the next five to 10 years, as long as there's Artemis programs and SLS and moon missions, the center will be busy testing rockets and stages. Um, the commercial work, some of the stuff I talked to you about at E-Complex and some of the other stands, it's hard to tell because, um, you know, it depends on which company may want to come use those facilities. Sometimes we'll, like in R68, we'll... We kind of gave the facility to uh, Airjet Rocket Time for 20 years to do the RS-68 testing, but then sometimes a commercial company may come in and just want to develop a piece of their rocket engine, a component. They may only be there for a few months or a year or two, and then they go back and do their testing somewhere else. So commercial side's always um, hard to predict. Um, you know, budgets are always tight. You know, we're always challenged to try to keep the facilities maintained and figure out ways to do that cheaper and more efficiently and, um, you know, more efficient use of the building space. So those are all some challenges that we deal with every day. Um, you know, if we can get the Enterprise Park, if we can get some more tenants in there to help maybe share in, in some of the burdens, you know, that would be great. And that's another effort we've got going on. And from what I can tell, the resident agencies that are out there are planning on staying. So um, I think stuff is really stable. Uh, and possibly a plus up maybe with some of that budget um, to help keep the facilities going for the, the, the Artemis missions. It's me again. Yes. I was interested in your educational and employment levels. With Stennis being a critical mission and the establishment of our Space Force, what is NASA doing to support public education in Mississippi so that students are coming through the ranks and getting the terminal degrees that are needed to keep this a viable mission. Wow, I wish Kelly was here. So we have a, you know, we have an education group and um, uh, science, technology, and engineering and math, and um, you know, they're doing some stuff called P2P outreach. I think at some universities, um, I think uh, some of our public affairs folks and education folks are out at. Are they in Greenville? In Greenville tomorrow. 
and I've been out there too. So um, Stennis is small, but we have a group of people that does outreach all the time and tries to advertise internship opportunities and co-op opportunities, and they're always um, targeting all the universities in the states. And um, so I know there's a there's a large effort there. Me, I got a uh, I stopped with a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. You know, I could have probably tried to get a master's or doctorate degree, but I really didn't like taking tests and doing homework. And <laughs> I had really been fortunate enough to get an internship job at Kennedy Space Center. So when I graduated, they were able to bring me on full time. And it was a hard choice of going and pursuing my other degrees. But when I had a chance to go down there to live in Florida and work with the space shuttle and the astronauts, I couldn't say no. And then, you know, after that, I started a family and everything. So I never really went back to get those uh, upper level degrees. And um, but, you know, like I said, the, 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 the chart on there with the different degree levels, um, you know, there's there's jobs for everybody at the center, depending on what level of, uh, of degree you have or even what kind of degree we've got bankers and lawyers and communications professionals, just like we have uh, engineers. But um, we do do a lot of outreach and um, you know, some of those people may be around tomorrow. I don't know at the museum. I know we're going to reach out to some of those uh, public school kids that may be coming in tomorrow. So we do try to get the word out and try to inspire people to, to get, um, you know, education in science and math. And um, Could you explain more what the Lunar Gateway is? A lot of people don't know about it or understand what it is. Yeah, I'll do my best. So... Uh, we're, you know, last time we went to the moon, we went straight there on the rocket, and then we docked, and the, and the module came back. So the Lunar Gateway is designed to stay in orbit around the moon, and it's supposed to be able to house a crew for several weeks. I don't remember how many days it is now. Um, and it, I, I call it a miniature space station around the moon. I don't know if officially they want to call it a space station, but that's really what it is. It's got a power module. Um, for um, to supply power and it's got a small um, habitation module so that you could you know you could bring a crew there and that's where you could dock and you could go down to the moon and come back or you could go to Mars from there so um, but it's designed to have um, several different parts and over time you know these different pieces would be installed kind of like we did with the, the International Space Station over in the Earth and we'd have, you know, you'd have a place there where people could stay in that in that orbit for extended periods of time, and um, so that's that's really what it's it's for is to you know for astronauts to spend more time in in lunar orbit, and possibly be a, you know a stopping point to come back and forth from from Earth. It's something we didn't have during Apollo, which I really hope I think it'll be great once we get that up and running. Uh, you mentioned there's a Moon mission. Is there a Mars mission in the future too? We haven't named the Mars mission like we have the moon, um, and, um, but there are plans to eventually go there. Um, and, you know, one of these things about the moon and the Mars, you know, a lot of times it depends on which administration comes in and which Congress and, and what they want to do. And so if you've been paying attention, you know, do we go to the Mars first or do we go to the moon? You know, to me, I think it's wise to, to head to the moon first and learn more about that before we try to go to Mars. Mars is a two-year trip to get there. It's two years back. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we got to learn. Um, NASA's working with several companies on technologies and projects and things, you know, to be able to, to make that, um, that, that trip um, where we're not ready yet. So um, I think we'll learn a lot from going to the moon, and then we'll see in the next few years. It'll, it'll be more budget to develop a Mars um, you know, NASA will need more money in order to build a transport vehicle to go to Mars. It's like we're trying to get the money to build the human lander right now. So a lot of it will depend on, you know, future administrations, Congress, where do they want to spend the money, what's the priority, and that kind of stuff. Um, and keep rooting for the commercial folks like SpaceX and Blue Origin and others. You know, a lot of times they partner with us, and sometimes they can do things cheaper, and, and sometimes they're, they can be more innovative from NASA because they've got a profit margin. And so, um, you know, I'm a fan for anybody that's building rockets and, and launching stuff into space. So um, and it's really neat in this country to have so many companies that are springing up. And a lot of them are being financed by these billionaires, you know, that are, that are, um, that are, that are doing this. And that's all, you know, um, resources that NASA can use. And in the future, NASA is looking to do more of that, buying those services from commercial providers as long as they can, they can be profitable. 
instead of trying to do it all ourselves. And that's one of the ways you, you end up getting to the moon and Mars without having to ask for triple or quadruple the budget we have. And when they went to the moon in the, in the 60s and 70s, you know, the budget was probably, I don't know, six times more percent of the federal budget. So, you know, that's one of the reasons they were able to do it so fast. And now people go, well, why is it taking so long? You know, because we just, you know, it's, it's really budget driven and priority driven. Gary, can you say a few words about what you brought for folks to pick up over Oh, there? yeah. So, um, uh, you know, our public affairs people were gracious enough to bring some stickers and some bookmarks and other things over there. So those are available if you want to take it home for a souvenir to your kid or grandkid or something. Uh, you know, I'll leave a copy of this book on the table. It, it's really the, the real history there, the first 30 years, and it fills in all the gaps. Um, and, uh, you know, I brought my Lego model rocket of the Saturn V just to, you know... It's my toy, and I like to bring it whenever I can. So, anyways, my time up. Probably getting close. So. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. I hope that <laughs> we see you back next week for Nash and Taggart. But now, help me thank Gary for this fabulous program today. Thank you. <laughs>